Long, long time ago, when the postal system was modernized, the chronically overworked postmaster general overlooked two tiny post offices, one tucked away in the rolling hills of Somewhere, the other somewhere in London. After unsuccessfully awaiting modernization, these two offices continued with their quiet lives until one day their daily routine was violently disrupted by the letters of Lady Susan, the most accomplished coquette in England. To avoid another scandal on social media, Lady Susan had now taken to letter writing and her letters were eagerly expected by the two post offices through which all of these letters coincidentally passed. What with the secrecy of the letter no longer being what it used to be, Lady Susan's letters soon ceased to be private after all. Well, Cecily, it looks like London has become the centre of action, what with all the major players now being in London. I'm actually rather relieved. Hmm. What was that? Well, you might have noticed that some of the letters caused some ill humour among my staff recently. Oh, I trust all is well again in Churchill. Well, at least nobody's fighting openly now. Well, why don't we ask them ourselves? Michael, Catherine, are you fighting? What? Do we look like we're fighting? <laughs> See, our finding. Well, uh, yes, Thomas, dear. I think Cecily was speaking more generally, but never mind. Ah, here you are. As I was beginning to say earlier, the letters are coming in more quickly now. So instead of calling you several times a day, we have decided to photocopy all the letters that arrive during one day and then call you every morning. Now, how does that sound? Do you have your letters? Right here. Oh, goody, goody. Helen, please begin. If I must. Yes, you must, because yours arrived first. Uh, I know that. Well, I have a rather short one. It's from Mrs. Johnson to Lady Susan. Edward Street. My dearest friend, I write in the greatest distress. The most unfortunate event has just taken place. Mr. Johnson has hit on the most effectual manner of plaguing us all. He had heard, I imagine, by some means or other, that you were soon to be in London and immediately contrived to have such an attack of the gout as must at least delay the journey to Bath, if not wholly prevented. I am persuaded that the gout is brought on or kept off at pleasure. It was the same when I wanted to join the Hamiltons to the lakes, and three years ago, when I had a fancy for Bath, nothing could induce him to have a gouty symptom. I am pleased to find that my letter has so, had so much effect on you and that the course is certainly your own. Let me hear from you as soon as you arrive and in particular tell me what you mean to do with mannering. It is impossible to say when I shall be able to come to you. My confinement must be great. It is such an abominable trick to be ill here instead of at Bath that I can scarcely command myself at all. At Bath, his old aunts would have nursed him, but here it all falls upon me. And he bears pain with such patience that I have not the common excuse for losing my temper. Yours ever, Alicia. Poor man. The gout must be painful. Maybe if he had kept in shape while he was still young, he'd suffer less now. Michael, you know that he can't hear you. Or change the past for that matter. I'm just saying, the poor man. I agree, but not only because of the gout, his wife doesn't seem to like him very much. Well, what else is new? <laughs> oh, yes, what else is new? We have two more letters. Thomas, if you please. Oh, yeah, certainly. <clears throat> this is from uh, Lady Susan to her friend, Mrs. Johnson. Upper Seymour Street. My dear Alicia, there needed not this last fit of the gout to make me detest Mr. Johnson, but now the extent of my aversion is not to be estimated. 
to have you confined as nurse in his apartment. My dear Alicia, of what a mistake were you guilty in marrying a man of his age, just old enough to be formal, ungovernable, and to have the gout. Too old to be agreeable, too young to die. Ooh, oh, well, is she talking about Mr. Johnson or herself here? <laughs> I thought this point. I arrived last night about five. I had scarcely swallowed my dinner when Mannering made his appearance. I will not dissemble what real pleasure his sight afforded me, nor how strongly I felt the contrast between his person and manners and those of Reginald's to the infinite disadvantage of Vieta. For an hour or two I was even staggered in my resolution of marrying him, and though this was too idle and nonsensical an idea to remain long on my mind, I do not feel very eager for the conclusion of my marriage, nor look forward with much impatience to the time when Reginald, according to our agreement, is to be in town. I shall probably put off his arrival under some pretense or other. He must not come till the mannering is gone. I am still doubtful at times as to marrying. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. If the old man would die, I might not hesitate. But a state of dependence on the caprice of Sir Reginald will not suit the freedom of my spirit. And if I resolve to wait for that event, I shall have excuse enough at present in having been scarcely ten months a widow. I have not given Mannering any hint of my intention, or allowed him to consider my acquaintance with Reginald as more than the commonest flirtation. And he is tolerably appeased. Adieu, till we meet. I am enchanted with my lodgings. Yours ever, Susan Berlin. As I was saying earlier, the poor man. Which one? Mannering isn't any better off, is he? <laughs> what? Mannering ought to be ashamed of himself. He has a wife. Yeah, I should not even think about another woman. I, I could never. Yes, Thomas, it isn't right. Now, why don't we move on? This letter is from Lady Susan to Reginald. <clears throat> I have received your letter, and though I do not attempt to conceal that I am gratified by your impatience for the hour of meeting, I yet feel myself under the necessity of delaying that hour beyond the time I originally fixed. Do not think me unkind for such an exercise of my power, nor accuse me of instability without first, first hearing my reasons. In the course of my journey from Churchill, I had ample leisure for reflection on the present state of our affairs, and every review has served to convince me that they require a delicacy and cautiousness of conduct to which we have hitherto been too little attentive. We have been hurried on by our feelings to handwriting. We have been hurried on by our feelings to a degree of precipitation which ill accords with the claims of our friends or the opinion of the world. We have been unguarded in forming this hasty engagement, but we must not complete the imprudence by ratifying it while there is so much reason to fear the connection would be opposed by those friends on whom you depend. It is not for us to blame any expectations on your father's side of your marrying to advantage. Your possessions are so extensive as those of your family, the wish of increasing them, if not strictly reasonable, is too common to excite surprise or resentment. He has a right to require a woman of fortune in his daughter-in-law, and I am sometimes quarreling with myself for suffering you to form a connection so imprudent. But the influence of reason is often acknowledged too late by those who feel like me. I have now been but a few months a widow, and however little indebted to my husband's memory for any happiness derived from him during a union of some years, I cannot forget that he, the indelicacy of so early a second marriage must subject me to the censure of the world and incur what would be still more insupportable the displeasure of Mr. Vernon. I might perhaps harden myself in time against the injustice of general reproach, but the loss of his valued esteem I am, as you will know, 
ill-fitted to endure. And when to this may be added the consciousness of having injured you with your family, how am I to support myself? With feelings so poignant as mine, the conviction of having divided the son from his parents would make me, even with you, the most miserable of beings. It will surely, therefore, be advisable to delay our union, to delay it till appearances are more promising, till affairs have taken a more favourable turn. To assist us in such a resolution, I feel that absence will be necessary. We must not meet. Cruel as the sentence may appear, the necessity of pronouncing it, which can alone reconcile it to myself, will be evident to you when you have considered our situation in the light in which I have found myself imperiously obliged to place it. You may be, you must be, well assured nothing but the strongest conviction of duty could induce me to whelm my own feelings by urging a lengthened separation and of insensibility to yours you will hardly suspect me. Again, therefore, I say that we ought not, we must not yet meet. By removal for some months from each other, we shall tranquilize the sisterly fears of Mrs. Vernon, who, accustomed herself to the enjoyment of riches, considers fortune as necessary everywhere, and whose sensibilities are not of a nature to comprehend ours. Let me hear from you soon, very soon. Tell me that you submit to my arguments and do not reproach me for using such. I cannot bear reproaches. My spirits are not so high as to need being repressed. I must endeavor to seek amusement, and fortunately, many of my friends are in town. Amongst them, the Mannerings, you know how sincerely I regard both husband and wife. I am very faithfully yours, Susan Vernon. I... <clears throat> I... I'm sorry, I, I can't. What's his problem? Thomas is a widower himself, remember? Oh, right. I'm sorry. But Lady Susan is quite a rogue, isn't she? Oh, she is, she is. Can you imagine playing with the two men just because she can? I mean, she can. Can she? But I'm still sorry for these guys. Oh, come on. They knew how she was, so they had it coming. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, please. On the other hand. No, really. It's just not. Of no. course you disagree. You're a man.